Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us here in this institutional seminar. So, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, announcing uh, today's guest speaker, Professor Sangamitra Mandubadhyay, who happens to be the director currently in Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, Professor Mandubadhyay did her B.Tech, M.Tech, and Ph.D. in Computer Science from Kakar University. IIT Kharagpur and ISI respectively. She has worked in various universities and institutes worldwide, including Los Alamos Laboratory. She has authored more than 145 journal papers and 140 articles in international conferences and book chapters, uh, and published six authored and edited books from publishers like Springer, Worldwide Scientific, and Wiley. Her research interests include computational biology and bioinformatics, soft and evolutionary computation, pattern recognition, and data mining. She is a fellow of IEEE, National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, India, INSA, that is Indian National Academy of, uh, so Indian uh, National, what is that? Science, Science Academy. Science Academy. <laughs> and the uh, National Academy of Engineering and West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. Sangamitra is the recipient of several prestigious awards including the Young Scientist Awards of the Indian National Science Academy, the Indian Science Scholars Association, the Swarajanti Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology, the Humboldt Fellowship from Germany, and also J.C. Bose, she is a uh, recipient of J.C. Bose uh, Fellowship as well in 2017. She has been selected as a senior associate of ICTP in Italy. She was awarded the prestigious Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Prize in Engineering Sciences. So, we all welcome Professor Madhubhatya for the talk today. Now think of a data as uh, you know a, a row in a matrix, 
So the, the different columns of that one, well, just think of one row with different uh, values, and each value represents some observation about a particular entity. Or one single row is for one entity. That can be a person, that can be a flower, that can be a patient, that can be whatever. That can be a tree, that can be an insect. I don't care what. So, but there are certain measurements that you take from that entity. So those are the features. Huh? You take whatever, some n-dimensional space, so n features. And sometimes you might have an additional information along with that for classifying that particular entity to one of the known classes. Okay? So it could be for as simple an example as, let's say, a person. Uh, one row is a person and there are two features, the height, let's say the height, weight, there are multiple features, let's say the height of the person, the weight of the person, the uh, color of the hair and the color of the eyes. So four features and another class label which says whether the person is a man or a woman. So let's say one for a man and zero for a woman or whatever. So you can understand now how one data would look like and if I take that data for all the members of this classroom, then I have what say so maybe there are I don't know 40 people here. So, 40 rows with four columns and one additional fifth column which tells me the class. Okay? So, that is how the data would look like. And here often there are problems like, okay, uh, can you, looking at this data, can you say, or can, are, you, are you able to distinguish between the two classes, the class 1 and the class 0, the man and the woman, just by looking at the height, weight, color of the eyes, color of the hair. So that is a very common problem which is solved in many, many different domains. That's called supervised classification problem. Why is it called supervised? Because you have a data set which is like a teacher, which has labeled data. So you have some examples of men, you have some examples of women, and from that data, that data acts like a teacher to you, supervisor, from that data you try to estimate what is it that makes a man and a woman different with respect to those four features. So that's a typical supervised classification problem and there are multiple very, very nice classifiers which are available which can learn from this data and after learning from the data, if you give it, give that classifier only a set of four features, then using its own classification principle, it will be able to tell you whether that person, that entity, that person is a man or a woman, is likely to be a man or a woman, right? So that is what a supervised classifier does. But very often, you just collect data, you don't have any label information, okay? You don't know whether it belongs to one class or the other. So then, the problem becomes, becomes one of unsupervised classification or typically called clustering, okay? So now, this clustering is a popular, as you can see here, unsupervised uh, classification method in the sense that you don't have any labeled data. All you have is just the data set itself without any class information and you have to group you have to detect some patterns, something of the to understand uh, that data. And whenever you actually have a lot of uh, information, what is it that one, uh, one generally does is one tries to see if there are certain data sets, data points which belong together, whether there's any structure in the, data, in the sense that whether there are groups in the data. Because that's often what is, uh, if we are faced with, uh, you know, some hundred different objects, we try to first group them together to understand what's going on. So, grouping is what clustering does. So, it will group the data points in such a way that different measures are optimized. So, the output <coughs> of clustering technique is typically a K. K is for the number of clusters. So, in many situations, you might know that, okay, this data has five clusters. Or that you are looking for five clusters in this data. Either way, okay? And in certain cases, you might not even have that information. You might not know how many clusters are possible. That's a more difficult problem. But let's say that you know that there are k clusters and there are n data points. So essentially, you are looking for is a matrix U, which is, you see, k times n matrix, which has values either 0 or 1 if the clustering is crisp or it can be any value between 0 and 1 if the clustering is fuzzy. We will come to what a fuzzy clustering versus crisp clustering is. Crisp, crisp clustering means for every data point you can for sure say that it goes to this cluster or to that cluster or to that cluster. You have no confusion about that. In fuzzy clustering, you will say that a data point i belongs to cluster k 
a belongs to cluster 1 with a membership of something, with cluster 2 to membership of something, because typically you say, just consider, if these are the two clusters, suppose there's some data point lying here, then you're not sure if it should go to 1 or 2, so you give some memberships. And uh, that is what this fuzzy clustering is, where you give certain memberships, and of course, for each point, the membership values for the different clusters should add up to one. So that is fuzzy clustering. And if it is, if there are cases where it might not uh, add up to one also, which is a different class of clustering. That's also there. So we are talking of fuzzy clustering for the present, okay, which is better suited for noisy data and data sets where there's a lot of overlap among the data <coughs> So this is a typical problem and where, where one very good algorithm where you know the number of clusters is the fuzzy seemings algorithm. It's very well known. Essentially what you don't, you don't need to go through this, but essentially what it does is it starts with a, let's say a random assignment, a random membership matrix. In such a way that, so what is a membership matrix then? Membership matrix will be number of clusters times the number of points. And ith point to the kth cluster, the membership value will be given by the entry k i, right? So this entry gives the membership value. Now, uh, you first start with a random initialization, but you make sure that each column should add up to one. That's how you start randomly. Once you have this, uh, so that is the initial u matrix, okay? Maybe you have this u matrix. Now, given the u matrix, what you do is you compute that if this is the membership of each and every point to the different clusters, then what should be the cluster centroid? The center of the cluster. Huh? That is, there is uh, something, this is the equation by which you compute this. And essentially what it says is, it is, because it was not fuzzy clustering, essentially it is just the average of the points. Okay, average of the points which go to one cluster, that is what the center would be. Mean, there's a mean. But now because it is fuzzy clustering, so you have some component of the membership values also. Essentially it remains the mean, the weighted mean, weighted by the membership values. <coughs> and once you have the cluster centers, then you recompute the, the membership values, okay, these values. How? So you have the cluster centers now. For every point, you will find out <coughs> the membership of this point to this cluster, to that cluster, to that cluster, etc. And how are you going to do it? A point which is closer, whichever center is closer, the membership will naturally be higher. Huh? So accordingly, with this equation actually, you are able to implement that. So the membership values, if you use this equation, then it will uh, have that property that whichever point is closer to whichever cluster, the membership is highest and that the summation is one, that will be taken care of. So this repeats. So once you have the membership values, then you go to recompute the cluster centers. Once you have the cluster centers, you recompute the membership values. Essentially, what is happening? Essentially, you see there is an error in this function. What is the fun first of all? What is the function that we are trying to optimize here? If we just again move away a little from the fuzzy clustering because it is slightly more involved to think, we have a big problem. So, the, what is the error? Error is essentially the root mean squared error. Okay. So. So if these are the points which are going to one cluster, this is the cluster center, the error will be this distance, square, the square of this distance, okay? And uh, then sum it up over all the points in the cluster, sum that up over all the clusters, and you have the squared error. So that essentially is the error. And this error function, error is a function of course, if you can think about of this, the error will be a function of all the membership values, or of the centers, whichever once you know the centers, you know the membership values. So all the centers here, so it's a multidimensional space. The error function is uh, in some n-dimensional space, depending on <coughs> how many uh, clusters you're looking at. And so error will be something, something like that. Essentially what this is, this algorithm follows is a gradient descent method. Okay, so you start away from, start from some random initialization, that means you start from some set of centers, let's say. So let's say it is here. This is your initial center, initial set of centers. And then this actually ensures that move, you are moving towards the negative gradient. Wherever the gradient goes, uh, the direction of the negative gradient, that means the error will go down. If you move from, so you've started from V0, a set of cluster centers, okay? 
and you will move this v0 to something like delta v0 in, in that direction where the error will go down. That is what this set of equations solve. And then you are guaranteed to start, a guarantee to come here and get stuck. You cannot do anything further because here, what is the gradient? The gradient disappears, right? Here it was, uh, some, you had a value, of it, but here it disappears, and therefore you know, don't know where to move. Which direction you move this way or that way, and anywhere you move, the error goes up. So you are, this is called typically called stuck at a local optimum. Ah, so, and most of these error functionals would have millions of local optima and very, very few global optima, maybe one, maybe a little more. Okay? So it is highly unlikely that you will come to this global minimum, which is the ideal solution, the best solution for this problem. Then highly unlikely you're going to do that. And therefore, these methods, these algorithms are guaranteed. Actually, they are theoretically guaranteed to go to the nearest local optima. Uh, so so this, this is actually the error. This, this is the error for the uh, fuzzy C means, which is this is this distance is of the kth point from the VF, from the ith center multiplied by a factor of the membership value, etc. So it is essentially the distance, the squared error. Okay, the squared error. So as I said, this sort of algorithm has its own problems. So it gets stuck at a local optima. Can we do better? So that is the question. The clustering, uh, it's uh, the classical algorithms are guaranteed to get stuck at local optima. Can we do better? Can we apply some other technique which will improve? Can we use some global optimization method which gives, which sort of doesn't guarantee but would go to a very good global optima? Okay, but it, uh, note that these methods, these are called meta heuristics, like genetic algorithms, and there are a host of other such heuristics which uh, do the optimization. Now, <coughs> these methods. Uh, they are sort of generic in nature. They can be applied to many, many different optimization techniques, not particularly to clustering, but, uh, but they are very robust. They will improve. There are no guarantees, but they, in very, very in many cases, they would improve on any solution that a, a local heuristic gives. Okay? And so this was one uh, reason why we started looking at genetic algorithms. And second was, uh, second why we went to multi-objective is that, you see, uh, one measure is this measure which we want to optimize, the JN, okay, the error function. But then we want to define a number of measures. When is this measure quite useful? When this measure is useful, when you have, you know, compact hyperspherical type of round round clusters, okay. But in other cases where the clusters can be of different shapes, then these, these methods may not work. I mean, this, this measure will not work. Huh? So, <clears throat> there are different other techniques, other, other approaches to handle, uh, you know, those metrics in such situations. Therefore, it is not necessary that you will always, when you look at clustering, you will always be interested in optimizing just a single measure. You might actually be optimizing multiple measures. And therefore, we came to this concept of multi-objective clustering. Again, know that it is not specific to clustering, multi-objective optimization methods, you will have many, many different problems which are multi-objective in nature. So uh, I will not go into the details of genetic algorithm, but um, uh, let's assume <coughs> that genetic algorithms work, okay, let's assume, and what is it? It is a population-based search in the sense that uh, in every iteration, you will actually be looking at multiple solutions. And you have a way, so this is called a population of solutions. You are able to rank those individuals, saying that this is better, this is worse, etc. And you have ways of generating from one population, uh, po another population which contains newer individuals. Okay? And then you are again able to you know, uh, compute the objective value uh, for each of those new individuals. And again, you will be able to rank and do something. So genetic algorithm is typical iteration-based search and population-based search. But let's come to this interesting area of multi-objective optimization. What is multi-objective optimization? First of all, there must be two or more different objectives which we want to simultaneously optimize and these objectives conflict with, with each other in the sense that if you want to if you optimize one, the other objective becomes worse. 
So then it becomes a real problem. Just take this example of going from point X to point Y. Okay? You immediately can see two different objectives here. One is the cost, one is the time. So planning a route for going from X to Y, minimizing the time and minimizing the cost is a multi-objective optimization problem. Because why? Because first of all, you have two objectives, cost and time. And second, you try to minimize the time, the cost will go up. You try to minimize the cost, the time will go up. Right? So it is impossible to optimize all objectives simultaneously. So you can understand from the perspective of a single objective optimization, what is the difference here? In single objective optimization, you are looking at an individual point and you are trying to improve that on the single objective that you see. But in multi-objective optimization, by its very nature, it does not admit a single solution. There is no single solution which will give the optimal value of all the objectives. So what are you looking for then? In multi-objective optimization, you are not looking for a single solution. Actually, you are looking for a set of solutions, a surface. Okay, a surface where all the solutions to you are in indistinguishable. Okay? Because one solution is better on the first objective, worse on the second. The second one is slightly worse on the first objective, but slightly better on the second objective, etc. So what you are looking for is, uh, is uh, something like this. Okay? You are looking for a, a surface, a front, okay? which is typically called the Pareto optimal front, if this is the best front which is possible. So what is it? Suppose at some point of time, you are looking at only solutions let's say 1 and 5. You have not yet seen solutions 2, 3 and 4. Assume that you have not seen solutions 2, 3 and 4. You are only looking at solutions 1 and 5. So then at that point of time, what is the best surface that you can think of? It is something which is joining 1 and 5 and if you just think a little, any point on that surface joining 1 and 5 is actually to you indistinguishable. Huh? Because you just look at this, 1 is better on F2 <laughs> but 5 is better on F1. Look at, uh, in fact, one, uh, 2 and 3. 2 is better than 3 on F2, but 2 is worse than 3 on F1. So to you, 2 and 3, you don't know what, which is better or which is worse. Because one is better on one objective, the other is better on the other object. So to you, it doesn't matter. So when you have seen only solutions 1 and 5, then this is the surface that you are looking at. But as soon as you see 2, 3 and 4, uh, 4 as soon as you see 2, 3 and 4, huh, then what happens is you immediately know that 5 is no longer a good solution. Because 2 and 3 and 4, all of them are certainly better than 5. Right? So therefore, you can easily forget about 5 now and you restrict your 2, 3 and 4. So this, this is a surface that you restrict your attention to. And <coughs> therefore, in multi-objective optimization, in contrast to single objective optimization where we try to improve a single solution, here we are trying to improve the front. We are trying to look at uh, all the solutions lying on a front. And if this is the best front that you, that is possible given this problem, then this is called the Pareto optimal front. Pareto is in the name of an economist, an Italian economist, this name, Vilfredo Pareto. Uh, who looked at uh, multi-objective problems in economics long, long time back in 1800s. So you can see that multi-objective optimization problems is not something which has come up now or come up today. It has been there for ages and people have been solving these problems, right? People have been solving, but what is the most common approach of solving these problems, multi-objective optimization problems? The most common approach is, okay, you have three objectives, O1, O2, and O3, then let's Join them with a uh, using a weighted averaging W1O1 plus W2O2 plus W3O3 and you have one single objective now. Uh, apply whichever technique is you, you are, is most favored with you. Huh? So that was the general approach which is followed. What is the problem with that approach? Why people came for such multi-objective uh, solutions where you can see if you join it with W1, W2, W3, that means if you have uh, approaches which which come up with a combined objective where is equal to W1 O1 plus W2 O2 plus W3 O3. Then, of course, you will at the end get a single solution, a single best solution, whichever is the best uh, for this combination. So, 
that actually is a little easier for you because if you are uh, if you are given 10 different solutions you don't know what to do with 10 solutions but if you are given only one option then it's sometimes better but sometimes you actually want to look at different options there are many problems where we actually want to look at different options and that is one one uh, reason why you want to go for such approaches because you want to look at other options second is you see you've done this combination this is a linear combination why have we gone for a linear combination? Because this is the easiest combination. But nobody says that this is the best combination, right? There could be some other very non-linear, uh, complicated forms which is the most appropriate. But we don't do it because that is, we don't know what it is. <coughs> you want to say something? Yeah, I think, I think the, the Pareto optimal front comes from the fact that you solve a series of single optimization problems. No, no, no it doesn't. Because single objective optimization problems will often not even let you see certain regions of the search space. Sure, but you can change the constraints with F2 or F1 and you know you can get the front. With rate. this, no, there are certain things which you will never see. That's what I'm saying. Whatever you do, sure. whatever values of W1, W2 you can possibly think of, it will always be constrained to line on a line. No, W1, W2 will come from the constraints. They are the Lagrangian multipliers. Right? Yeah, these are the Lagrangian multipliers. So they'll come from constraints. Uh, Suppose you think of a problem, problem which has, okay. it's an unconstrained optimization. Uh, if it is an unconstrained optimization, and then uh, you would be actually, even then, wherever it comes from, it is still, you know, still restricted to move along a line. This line will change depending on what uh, values of W's you take. Yeah. This line is going to change, but it will not allow you to look at. Uh, non-convex combinations of these objectives. That is another thing which and nobody says this is the best combination and thirdly often these objectives are you know it's it's very difficult to combine them together uh, because they lie in different uh, scales and therefore so there are some different uh, problems by doing that weighted combination and these methods actually let you look at many different uh, points of that space and secondly, they have no restrictions that the functions themselves, the function has to be, um, you can take, it has to be continuous or anything, no, all those restrictions are removed. Because these methods will work, the genetic algorithm method will work for or does not make any such assumptions about the functions that you want to optimize, right? So because of that, uh, this this is an example of non-domination in a sense. What is domination? For example, two, three, and four. They these are the points which dominate five. But with respect to each other, they are called non-dominating. That is why this term non-domination has come. And the best surface over the entire space is called the correct optimal surface. Now there are different approaches for multi-objective optimization. Uh, these were the very primitive approaches and then these Pareto based approaches came up and NHGA2 is one algorithm which is very commonly used all over the world. Uh, it was actually developed by, um, some, uh, by a professor from, um, from IIT Kanpur, uh, Professor Kalyan Mahadev and that was one of the first very very good algorithms for multi-objective optimization which, uh, which appeared and therefore it has been used heavily in many different domains. This is, this is actually our own method which we called Ar uh, Archive Multi-Objective Simulated Annealing. And this method is based on not genetic algorithms, so a different technique which is called simulated annealing, but it also solves multi-objective optimization problems. Now, one problem, uh, you see, as soon as you look at multi-objectivity, one problem is how do you compare between two solutions? Because if you had a single objective, it's very easy to say this is better, this is worse. But when you have multiple objectives, then how do you compare? That was one problem which has that is one problem which has to be tackled in multi-objective optimization problem. But let me just very quickly give you the flowchart of this algorithm, the uh, NSGA2 algorithm. So essentially, you start with a population of solutions, and then you do something called ranking. How do you do the ranking? You look at every solution, and then so you suppose this has two different objectives. Okay, you have the two objectives and then you look at every other solution and compare it with this and try to see if there is any solution which is dominating this solution. That is, dominating means 
on most of the objectives they might be the same, exactly the same and in the few remaining objectives this one is better. Then I would say that this is dominating this. Now, once you run this algorithm, okay, so you then are left with those solutions whom nobody, nobody dominates. So that is essentially the rank 1 solutions. So you have the rank 1 solutions, you remove the rank 1 solutions from your space and then run the algorithm again. Next time, whatever you get would be the rank 2 solutions and so on. So this is the ranking of the solutions that you do. <coughs> and then you do certain selection. There is a selection mechanism where you select from this set. But then interesting part is here, you come to a set of child, another set of uh, solutions which is called the child population and then you join PI and CI. So now if this size, size of this population is let's say P, then here now you have 2P solutions. From 2P solutions you have to come back to P solutions. Okay, how do you do it? You rank these solutions again, this combined population you re-rank and then the rank 1 solutions, okay, if there are less than p uh, rank 1 solutions, then you take all the rank 1 solutions to your next population, take rank 2, etc., till your population gets overfilled, okay, till you cross p. And then you remove the last uh, ranking solutions and then select only the remaining. Suppose uh, the size, ideal size is 30, 10 have come here, 10 have come here, so 20 is already over, but 15 are here, but you need only 10. So you have to pick up 10. Now which of the 10 that you pick from this 15 is in, is in terms of the diversity of the solutions. That is, see if you are solving a multi-objective optimization problem where okay you have two different objectives but <coughs> if you say that um, all your potential solutions are very close to each other in the sense that if this is the space that you are looking at and all your solutions lie here, so somewhere here, these are your solutions very dense, then you see it's there's really nothing to choose from, okay. It's time and cost if you think, one is 100 rupees, another is two, uh, the time is 2 hours, one is, okay, not 100 but 99 and the time is 2 hours and 1 minute, so you don't really care. If, if, uh, that's not really called a set of options. Set of options would be very, very different, okay, 2 hours, 100 rupees, maybe 5 hours but 5 rupees, then you have something to choose from. So essentially here, the solutions that you select from this last population would be the ones which are residing in sparse regions, okay, not crowded regions. From crowded regions, you select only one, the representative. So that is how you ensure the diversity in the population and then this method actually keeps on iterating. So, <clears throat> and at the end, what do you, what is the solution of the problem? The solution is a set of rank 1 solutions. Uh, all the rank 1 solutions is the is provided to the user as a set of solutions. Uh, we had a, an approach for solving the clustering problem using such, uh, uh, using genetic algorithms. Essentially what we did is, forget about what is written here, but essentially what we did was that we, en we encoded the cluster centers in each individual solution. So each individual solution would give a set of cluster centers and then once you know the cluster centers it is easy to work out what the clustering possibly is. Once you work that out then you can actually find out different measures of the goodness of that clustering. So every solution will be associated with a set of values which will indicate how good the clustering solution is. And that is basically the population of solutions would essentially give you uh, different clusterings of the same data. Now. We forget about the details of the implementation here, but then what, let's say at the end, we land up with these eight solutions, okay. Suppose we land up with these eight solutions, and this is the Pareto optimal front which was generated by the method. Each individual corresponds to a clustering of the data set, and let's say this individual corresponds to this particular clustering into four clusters. And let's say there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 data points. Okay? So this is a problem with 11 data points. Of course, you will not re solve real problems with these methods. For 11 data points, you will not really do apply any of these techniques. But this is just an illustration. So suppose the first solution actually gives this clustering, which is 1, 1, 1. So all these three points go to cluster 1. The remaining two, uh, 
next two to cluster two, then these four to cluster three, and then it drops two to cluster four. Similarly, this is actually giving this clustering, etc. So these are the different clusterings which are provided by this uh, by these eight solutions. Now, how do you combine? So uh, you are free to actually provide the user with all these independent solutions, or you could possibly give suggest a combined solution. So one suggestion that we came up with for, for combining these <coughs> solutions was that we <coughs> apply the 50% voting rule in the sense that for every point we see what is the cluster number that which cluster in which cluster number is that particular solution putting that point to. Uh, so here there is no confusion. Every every solution says that it should go to cluster number one. So you are sure about it. You put it to cluster number one. Similarly, here more than fifty percent agree that uh, the point should go to cluster number one. Therefore, you put one here. But here the agreement fifty percent agreement is not there. Okay. You uh, can see here at least half of the solutions don't agree. So therefore, you are not <coughs> sure about this cluster belongingness and put a question mark here. Question mark here. Similarly, here most of them say that it's two. So you put two here, etc. Okay. So at the end, you are left with this set where there are certain data points you are not really sure, but certain other data points where you are reasonably sure that these are the cluster numbers. Okay, and then you run a supervised classifier for this problem in the sense that you take for these eight point, uh, eleven points, you assume that these are the training data points. The one with the numbers would be your training data points. Okay, and one with the question marks would be the test data points. So you train this classifier and ask it to predict the classes of these three points. There are many issues which come into uh, the picture here. You can immediately think of many issues, many problems that one might face. But this is a general solution, general, you know, the, the approach that uh, is used for combining the different clusterings into a single one. Okay. And uh, so this was just an illustration, but we actually applied it to microarray gene expression data, which you might know that uh, uh, it is essentially like, uh, it's, it's a matrix where uh, there, there could be different types of data, but here it is like every row is a gene and every column is the some condition. It could be different types of condition, but some condition. And <coughs> the value here represents whether the, gene, the expression level of the gene. And very often it is important to be able to cluster these genes into coherent groups, okay? So this is, a, if, you, if you think of, these are time points, okay? Time points, so maybe the first hour, the second hour, the third hour, etc. And these are the expression values over the <coughs> time point, and these are like time, this is like time series data, right? So like even stock market data could be represented here, etc. So it, you now want to know what are the groupings here which are the genes which behave similarly. So this is a clustering of the gene expression data and uh, we applied it to some very well known data sets. These are uh, very commonly used data sets. And we, apply, uh, we have another uh, unsupervised index okay, to measure the goodness of this clustering. Note that this, this index was not used while optimizing. So the method never saw this index it's only after the clustering is done that we sort of compare. There could be different other indices on which you can compare, but this is one very commonly used index in the bioinformatics literature, silhouette index. And um, so here we compare all the multi-objective approaches because there could be you know different uh, different combinations. You use one algorithm and another algorithm for the classifier, and you can combine in different ways. You can uh, so we for the supervised classifier we use support vector machines, but you can have different kernels. So these are uh, the different possible combinations which we looked at and this gives the index value but when we compared it with other non-multi-objective optimization approaches, uh, the Sirioth index uh, its values range between minus 1 and 1 and larger the value better it is. So this multi-objective, uh, this class of multi-objective algorithms outperformed the single objective or other approaches certainly and among these the multi-objective uh, with the support vector machine with uh, I think it was a, a sigmoid kernel 
and uh, RBF kernel and um, uh, that actually outperformed the other combinations. But this is just uh, one study, uh, as I said, uh, these are different ways of representing the same uh, same result, okay, how, how compact the transfers are, you can just have a look here. Uh, and we also did some significance testing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other algorithms, which results were quite encouraging. Uh, so, to wrap up, this was, uh, you know, just an approach which, which seemed to work very well for such algorithms, uh, for such problems, but then, as I said, multi-objective uh, whether you are going to use NSJ2, whether you are going to use any other approach is absolutely at the discretion of the user. It is not to say that one approach works better than the other approach, there are multiple ways of combining, but Generally, it appears that the approach of using a multi-objective optimizer with a clustering problem has potential to yield much better results than many other methods which are out there. So, with that, I'll just uh, conclude. Uh, these are some references, uh, not really updated because I did not get too much time to update the list of references. Um, but uh, we have a book. I don't know whether it is. Is, it appears it's written here, but we have a book uh, published, uh, I think, in 2014, which is totally on multi-objective clustering. So different approaches, and uh, uh, so you can have a look there. And these methods are all described in detail, uh, also in these publications. And uh, if you want to know more details, I can just direct you to the appropriate uh, references. But if you have any questions, I will conclude with that. In case you have any questions, uh, any doubts. Uh, what would be your experience of planning in local minima as a position? See, uh, uh, if you are using <coughs> methods like this, they have their own inbuilt mechanism to bring you out of the local optimum. So, but what happens is very often uh, these methods are so generic in nature that if you just uh, if you just let the method take over and not help it in any way in the sense that if you uh, don't combine some local optimizer with these meta heuristics, it takes a long, long, long time to converge. Okay, but if you, uh, if you integrate some local optimization technique, okay, so it starts from one solution, but then a quick, uh, a, a very fast heuristic takes over and then improves that solution to whatever level is possible. Okay, and then the this solution is replaced by whatever the locally optimized solution and then the method again you know, does this combination of solutions, brings in changes for mutations or uh, com combines information from different solutions to come up with better solutions, etc. So it has its own operators. So combination of these two often work very well. If you just let the uh, meta uh, do the job, entire job on its own, sometimes it's, uh, it, it has its own problems in converging. And so, any more questions? So, it looks like we don't have any more, so we'll just... Thank you very much. And uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Raghavan to hand over a token of application. So, Excellent lecture, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.